Whisperin' Horror by Eddie C. Burton I had known Harvey Denver since we were both four years old. We went together to the kindergarten and thereafter to the same small village school. We shared the same friends, the same enemies and a dislike for the same teacher. We enjoyed the same games and hobbies, almost as two brothers. To his memory, I will now write the real facts, as much as I know them, or want to know them, about that summer day, many years back now, when I ran screaming from the graveyard where Harvey was buried. Maybe you'll think them part of a boy's nightmare, something which doesn't or can't happen in this nice, safe little world of ours where there is no place for the unknown, the impossible. I know otherwise, and I don't care if you believe me or not. There is no proof, not any more. The only proof is in my brain, where it has been haunting me ever since, always returning in horrible nightmares, in a fear for dark places. But maybe this is the way to whip it all out of my mind, where every detail is engraved, our walks together, the ruins, and the whispering. It started the summer when we were both nine years old. We were born the same year, Harvey in April, and I in June, which made him the natural leader for our two-man expeditions, the more as he was bigger and stronger than myself. After school time, we enjoyed taking long walks so that we could play in the forest, which was about a kilometre from our village. The wood was nothing exceptional, a bunch of trees and bushes thrown together by playful nature, but to us it was paradise. Usually we didn't go deep into the woods, we had felt once, on our bottoms, the troubles which arose when we had stayed out too late. Also the forest soon became much thicker and darker and we still feared we would get lost some day. We no longer believed in witches and gnomes, but we were still afraid of the dark, even if we would never confess it. Still, on a free afternoon with time to spare, we penetrated much deeper than usual. It was then that we found a house, or what was still left of it. That wasn't much, just the entrance to a cellar, a mass of stones and part of one crumbling sidewall, miraculously still standing, like a lonely sentinel. It must have been a very small house, most of which was built of timber, that later on had been used for other purposes. Only the cellar seemed to be intact. Curious, we went and looked into the black hole, waiting each for the other to go in first. It would have to be Harvey, of course, but he didn't seem very anxious to lead the way. He descended two steps, bent, and looked once again. Can't see a thing, he whispered. Of course not, how could you? I answered, whispering too. There isn't a single window anywhere. Must be dark, like hell, down there. I don't know why we whispered. Maybe it was the loneliness of the ruins of the house, the dampness which welled up out of the dark cave in gulps of foul air. I shivered, although I wasn't cold, but somehow the warmth couldn't quite reach me. Could there be anyone there? Harvey asked. His voice, soft as he spoke, seemed to bounce back against the spider-webbed cellar walls and return to us in a hollow whispering, like some lost voice drifting off on faraway winds. Are you crazy? I hushed him. Who could live in a hole like this? There's nothing there. Come on, let's go and play somewhere else. Our voices answered out of the dark entrance, the lonely crumbling wall bitten through by time, the damp steps leading down into the abyss of shadows, almost seemed to radiate in a feeling of... There's no right word for it. Something old, unholy, something evil. Evil, especially to us, intruders in its domain. Come on, Harvey, I whispered, 
I don't like this at all. Let's get out of here. But he didn't hear me. His head bent. He was listening very sharply. Suddenly, he looked up at me. Did you hear that? he asked. I didn't hear anything, I answered. I tried to laugh, but it sounded so strange and out of place that I stopped immediately. The only thing I heard was the echo of my own voice. I thought, I thought I heard someone breathing, he whispered. My ears had received no sound, and I didn't like it at all. Whatever could breathe in a dark cave like this? But then it couldn't. He must have heard wrong. There was nothing down there. There couldn't be. I took Harvey's arm. Come on, let's get away. No, wait. He shook himself free and listened intently. Holding his breath, spying the darkness with his ears, almost eager to capture a sound. It sounds like a dog panting. A dog? I said. Why should a dog be down there? Could be anything, even a wild animal. Maybe he fell, Harvey said. Maybe he slipped on the stairs and broke a leg. Maybe his own sent him in there to let him die of starvation. Some people would do a thing like that. He had stopped whispering. You wouldn't let a dog die down there, all alone and in darkness, heart and want and company, would you? I didn't answer. Listen, he said, it's almost like moaning. Now I'm sure there's something down there, something alive and hurt. I'm going to see what it is. Suddenly, I was deadly afraid to be left alone. I grasped Harvey. No, please, don't go down. It is bad, I feel it. Now don't start acting like a sissy, he snapped. The poor thing's probably just hungry. You stay here if you're scared. Slowly, taking care not to slip on the stone steps, covered with lichens and dirt, he descended. It smelled dusty and damp. Small creatures hurried away over the steps. Of course I couldn't stay behind now, which would have proved me a coward. So I followed him, the fear throbbing in my throat. Down there, into the absolute darkness, filled the first seconds with coloured lights and stripes and circles, dancing on my irises. Then, after a while, I made out the dark shapes of old furniture, the walls of the cave, and something dark, in a corner of the cellar, something slowly moving. It seemed almost to flow, an indefinable black form, laying flat on the floor. There is the poor animal, Harvey said, with a courage I would never have believed him capable of. Or maybe it now seems recklessness. He stretched his hand to touch it, and then the thing whispered. Not a moan or a groan, not a recognisable sound, but a thick, slimy whisper, which seemed to go on and on between the slippery walls. The whisper of something old and feeble, something slimy and swollen, which seemed dead and yet alive, as if it had just awakened from a long sleep. Something petrified and timeless, suddenly coming to itself. I turned and ran, my only thoughts for free air and light. I slipped on the stairs and hurt my knee, but then I was out of the darkness and away from the horrible whispering. Outside, I got my breath and courage back, but not enough of the last to go back inside. I cursed my own cowardliness, but I didn't return. I just sat down and waited, then got up and started to walk around the ruins. Twice I called, but got no response of any kind. Not a sound came from the cellar. Harvey was alone down there, with the whispering thing. I waited. There was nothing else to do. Then after a quarter of an hour, Harvey came out of the infernal darkness. He was pale, and so I knew that he too had been scared, even if he was laughing now. Coward, he teased. Whatever did you run away from? There's nothing horrible down there, just a poor sick old dog, feeling lonesome. I didn't say anything. I knew Harvey had lied to me. 
whatever had whispered down there in the slimy darkness hadn't been a dog or any other animal I knew. We went home and got our second spanking for being late for supper. The next days and weeks I saw less and less of Harvey. He almost seemed to evade me. Whenever he spoke to me, he was short and unfriendly. Not at all his usual self. Sometimes, on free days, I saw him leave the village as soon as he could get away, to go to the cellar in the forest. Twice I accompanied him, but I didn't follow him down into the darkness, although he asked me to. He told me the dog was better now, and wanted to play with me also. It was a very old and friendly dog, Harvey said. He was so long and thin. Harvey nicknamed him Steak for that. Sometimes he told Harvey stories, and that's how I cornered Harvey. Outside a circus, I had never heard a dog speak, and everyone knew in a circus it was just a trick. So Harvey had to admit it wasn't a dog that whispered to him. Steak was a man, he said at last. A friend. He was old, very old. More than two hundred years, he had told Harvey, and he had come a long way. He had been very sick, and he had been so long in the dark that the sun hurt his eyes. He never came out, even not at night, so if I wanted to meet Steak, I should go to him. One day I almost did. I followed Harvey down the slithery stone steps, leading downward into a hungry stomach of waiting shadows. My back felt hot and cold at the same time, and I was deadly afraid. Nevertheless, I followed. Then I was down and groping my way, trying to see a thing. Then it whispered, a soft throaty whisper, slimy and unspeakably evil. Dawn? It whispered my name in almost unrecognisable words, as if it spoke with a tongue not meant to utter human words. I cried out. I couldn't hold it back. I panicked, stumbling out of the nauseating cave in a mad flight. And then I ran, away from the forest, and the cave with its hellish horror. I never went near it again. Harvey stopped playing with me altogether from that day on. In fact, he evaded all the other boys and girls of the village, too, and always went out to play alone. Once I overheard a conversation between our parents, and I heard them say that Harvey was always much too late outside. They said he even one night leaped through the window, thinking them asleep, and went out to the forest. Then they started suspecting things about Harvey and girls, which I didn't understand completely. But his father finished the argument, saying that Harvey was still much too young for that. It was just the boy's wild nature, he thought. But after a while, people began to notice how pale and sick he looked. I had seen it already for a long time, and I knew it to be the bad influence of the thick, stale air in the cellar, and the fact that he was always down there in the dark, and never played any more in the sunlight. But I didn't tell on him, and maybe that's my big guilt. Then he fell sick. The doctor said he had never seen a boy of his age looking so pale. His whole face was thin, almost fallen in flesh around his skull bones. You could see his cheekbones sticking out. He had lost much weight too. The doc couldn't exactly say what was the matter with him, and that was strange too. Harvey had never been sick before, except the usual children's diseases. The doc ordered plenty of fresh air, wholesome food, and some vitamin pills. And if that didn't help, his parents should go and see a specialist in the city. And Harvey had always been so strong and healthy looking. The second week of his sickness, I'll never forget. It was the next time I came unwillingly in contact with Harvey's friend, Steak. It was a cloudy, moonless night. The weather was fine, warm and windless, but just not too hot. I had left the window of my room open. I wasn't asleep yet, which was lucky for me. Otherwise, I'd never had heard it. 
before it would have been too late. It came from the woods towards the village. Maybe it was bored. Maybe it wanted some company. Or just wanted to find Harvey. They were my thoughts then. Now I know the much more important and much more horrible reason it had come out of its cellar. I heard the slow dragging steps on the path and then the crunching of the gravel. Don't ask me how, I just knew, with an unsettling clearness, what it was that walked stealthily towards our house through the protecting darkness outside, hidden even from the moonlight. In one movement, I was out of bed and smashed the window shut. The very next second, something whispered very softly outside. There was a rubbing sound against the window, as if some soft body pressed against the cold wall, trying to get in. Always whispering. There was nothing to be seen in the darkness outside. Then the moon came through the clouds for a few fleeting moments. An eye of ice looking downwards that gave me the first glimpse ever of the unknown which is always at our side. The whispering went on, and something clawed against the glass making sharp lines in it, as if for some eternal seeming seconds moonlight flooded the scene outside and there was nothing there. Real fear runs through your veins like ice. It crawls upwards under your skin to your neck. It feels like suddenly standing on the brink of an abominable deep pit with crawling emptiness. Something was there and yet wasn't. I don't know how I managed to move, but somehow I shrunk backwards, never letting the window out of my sight. I couldn't breathe. Unseen claws seemed to grope me in my stomach and lungs. I'll never know which reflex or instinct made me reach for the chair. I was very young then, and I had never had any experience with the unseen. I had reached, in those few seconds, a breaking point. I cried out and threw the chair towards the thing beyond the window. The glass splintered as I ran to the door. It wasn't necessary. It moved outside, very quick, away from the house. I got a spanking for having broken the window, and then they had to call the doctor to give me a sedative. Nobody paid attention to the glass splinters, which all lay inside the room. I had seen how the glass cracked and broke, just before the chair reached it. Then Harvey died, very suddenly, in the middle of the night. The doctor said his heart unexpectedly gave up, for no special reason at all. He had grown very weak and thin, almost just skin over his bones. He had simply passed away, from this world into another. I hope it was into a better one. Two days later he was buried. Everyone I knew from the neighbourhood was there. Serious looking people everywhere. Many people wept. I don't know if I cried. When you're nine years old, there's no real understanding of the word death. I only felt Harvey was far, far away from me now, and he would never come back. Yes, maybe I did cry. The next day, a free afternoon, I went alone to the churchyard to look at Harvey's tombstone and all the pretty flowers on it. Then I heard it again. Now it wasn't sneaking. Covered by the dark of night and a moonless sky, it came as an angry thunderstorm, angry, mad, towards Harvey's grave. I jumped away, ran a few steps, and let myself roll behind a large tombstone, where I stayed hidden, shivering with uncontrollable fear, while the raven terror came nearer and nearer, until it was so close I could hear it, the loathsome, angry whispering. Much, much later I came home to break down in my mother's arms, raving and crying, trying to escape from every shadow in the room. They didn't believe anything I said until my father, to calm me, went to the graveyard and saw what somebody or something had done to the fresh grave and the stone, to the dug-up, broken coffin and to what was now still left of Harvey's little body. I was delirious for two days before I could speak coherently of the cellar in the wood, and Harvey's friend who lived there. They didn't believe it at first. 
but they went nevertheless to find out what was true of my story. They went in a crowd, armed with shovels, pickaxes, guns and electric lamps. They came back late in the night, looking very tired and somehow scared. None of them said anything. The next day, my father told me I must have dreamed everything. They had only found a dead dog in the cave. Only now, many years later, my father too has passed away, and before me I have his diary on that day. In his fine and yet strong handwriting, at last I know what they really found down there. It was something which could have been human once, but I can't be sure. Neither can any one of us. It was a skeleton smaller than a normal man, and crouching as if it wasn't meant to walk upright. But on those yellow bones, new flesh, new muscles, and fresh, soft skin were growing. Weak ones, nevertheless, the muscles and flesh of a young boy. They could hardly keep the heavy thing moving. It tried to strike us, and it whispered to us, as Don had told us. When Frank and then Wilfred hit it with their shovels, it whimpered. We crushed it with our spades, split the bones of the unspeakable thing, and all the time it kept on whispering to us and trying to fight us. It couldn't get past us out of the cellar, and we kept it in the white burning circles of our torches. God forgive me, if it was something which had the right to live, but I don't think it had. The life which moved it was stolen, as was the flesh which grew on it. A foul stench of decay came in gulps out of it, when we broke the bones and split the soft skin. There was blood too, thick, and spread in a foul stench of something very old and very dead. Harold cut an arm with a blow of his shovel, and the arm and the hand kept on moving, crawling over the floor. Then Frank heard something outside. He and Peter went to look, and they swear there was nothing to be seen, yet suddenly trees were pushed aside, and something struck them away from the entrance with a formidable strength. We all heard something come down the stairs, and at that exact moment I split the skull of the moaning horror with my pickaxe. There was a loud shriek, suddenly cut off, and then there was nothing beside. The whispering had stopped and the loathsome parts of flesh, bones and muscles lay silent. I can't think of that moment without shuddering. What could the thing have done to us, if, by pure luck, I hadn't hit the skull at the exact moment before the invisible projection, I can't think of a better suited word for it, reached us? We burned everything which was on the floor of the cave, and then we made the cellar collapse over the ashes so that, now there is nothing but a heap of crumbling stones. They never knew what it had been exactly. Neither did they make much effort to find out. There are some things which don't belong to this world. It is best to leave them alone completely. But I can't forget what is burned in my memory by such a petrifying fear as I had never known, and hope will never know again. It is that day when I lay alone behind the shadow of a tomb, shivering madly in the full sunlight, while something unseen crushed Harvey's tombstone and broke open his grave, always whispering, whispering.